Show your support. Join the discussion in the comments. Hello, I am that British guy and welcome to my review of the first ever NXT TakeOver. Now from the opening video package we get the idea that the reason they call this TakeOver is they show a number of superstars that have come from NXT and basically taken over the main roster. The likes of Rusev and Paige and The Shield where they have made an impact in NXT and then moved up to the main roster to try and dominate up there as well. So, yeah, that was kind of news to me. Um, I assumed that the name came from when they took over a certain town, but um, it seems that they were basically taking over the WWE itself. We have the three-man commentary team of Tom Phillips, Byron Saxton, and not Corey Graves, but William Regal. It was an okay trio, I guess. William Regal doing his best to put over the heels as much as possible, um, or the work rate that certain superstars were putting in, and also trying to give some kind of an insight from an in-ring perspective. Tom Phillips kind of was just sort of there, and Byron Saxton was flip-flopping from heel to face um, in every single match virtually with every single call that he was making, sometimes arguing against William Regal and sometimes agreeing with him, which was really weird because then we didn't really properly have a face commentator. We open up with a match between Adam Rose and Camacho. Camacho presumably didn't really make much of himself because I certainly don't remember him um, so presumably he never really properly made it to the main roster obviously Adam Rose isn't around anymore either and I can kind of see why with a gimmick like this he comes out with a load of dressed up people the Rosebuds um, this match was probably most noticeable for two things one um, I noticed within the collection of Rosebuds Simon Gotch Becky Lynch and Braun Strowman, so that was always nice, sort of a shout out to them. Um, and once the match had finished, William Regal made a brilliant uh, kind of dad type joke, uh, mentioning the Rosebuds. He said there was, um, in one of them, he was trying to point him out, a one-legged Elvis. And he said that he did a wonderful rendition of Blue Suede Shoe. That really tells you all you need to know about this match, really. It was sort of a basic WWE match, the heel gets most of the heat for the majority of the match and then Adam Rose fires back very very quickly and ends up winning. There's not really much more to say, there's nothing really to add in terms of what these guys are doing now so let's just move on. We then get a video package hyping up Sami Zayn and particularly his match this evening against Tyler Breeze. This will be a number one contenders match and this kind of harkens back to the NXT arrival, the first sort of pay-per-view type show that they did where he faced off against Cesaro and ultimately lost and this is kind of him trying to get back onto the road to redemption really, win this number one contenders match and become the NXT champion. Next up we have the Ascension defending the tag titles against Callisto and El Local who is the biggest luchador I think I've ever seen and I don't mean big in terms of tall. He kind of basically looked like a fat Sin Cara. Now at this point the Ascension were 239 days into their run, their run which still hasn't been topped by anyone. And it's nice to sort of go back to some of these older appearances of the Ascension and just see how dominating they were because they certainly aren't anything like that on the main roster and never have they been. I think they're the highlight of their WWE career has been their time in NXT and what a, a dominating force they were. Um, and that kind of speaks volumes for the fact that their their title reign has not yet been beaten. Although War Raiders, I presume, may just uh, kind of topple that as well. As you could expect, the Ascension get the majority of this match. They completely dominate and decimate Kalisto, throwing him around the ring, slamming him about. Frequent uh, tags in and out for Connor and Victor. 
Kalisto does manage to kind of get the hot tag to El Local, who doesn't really do much apart from botch a springboard attempt on the second rope. He just about manages to catch it enough to bounce back um, and hit a crossbody. But other than that, he really doesn't do much. He takes the fall of man and the ascension win and take their unbeaten run to 240 days. Obviously already mentioned the, the kind of downward trajectory for the Ascension once they got up to the main roster. Kalisto, funnily enough, along with Sin Cara, does actually manage to topple the Ascension and take the tag team titles away from them. Um, he has also become the Cruiserweight Champion on 205 Live. Um, but other than that, not really a lot for Kalisto and El Local I have never seen before or since and I've got no idea who on earth is under the mask. If you've got any ideas, please let me know in the comments. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of passed me by, that guy. Right, with those two kind of nothing matches out the way, the, the meat of the show is these last three matches. That is basically what this entire show is built around. And first up, we have that number one contenders match between Sami Zayn and Tyler Breeze. But before that, we get the second video package for that match, basically focusing in on Prince Pretty himself, Tyler Breeze. Now, in this video package, they're basically trying to put over that he sees himself as, literally as the face of NXT. And the way of getting more cameras and eyes on him is to become the NXT champion and become the face of the brand. There is quite a nice little cameo in this uh, video package, including um, a much younger looking Alexa Bliss. Looking very sort of plain Jane, to be honest. It uh, is very odd seeing her in that light. Presumably this is long before she even teamed up with Blake and Murphy. And obviously long before she basically ripped off the Harlequin kind of look. But yes, the main point of this video package is to put over the fact that Tyler Breeze is not just a pretty face. When the bell rings, when he is in between the ropes, he is all business. And... If there is a chance for him to become the NXT champion, then he is going to do everything within his power to make sure that he is the next NXT champion. Now, the match itself, what is quite nice is William Regal carries on this thread throughout the match, really putting over the fact that Tyler Breeze is all business and because he wants to be the face of NXT, the best way for him to accomplish that is to win this match here and then topple the NXT champion and to become the next champion. Sami Zayn comes out first and what was immediately obvious was the fact that the crowd weren't really singing the ooh, 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 of his theme song. They were just kind of cheering Ole which again kind of makes sense given his history but it was quite odd to hear that instead of the the singing along with his music but at least he was very much over as the baby face in this match. Tyler Breeze then enters and this is before the selfie stick day so he's just got his phone in hand and makes his elaborate over the top entrance. Now it is announced that this match was made after the triple threat match that they had which did include Tyson Kidd. Tyson Kidd ended up winning that match and will be facing Adrian Neville for the NXT Championship in the main event. But the GM of NXT, who at that time was JBL, decided that these two guys needed a sort of second chance and put them in a match against each other for the next number one contendership. Now this match starts off very back and forth and Sami Zayn kind of slowly is starting to get the advantage until he is knocked off of the top rope to the outside by Tyler Breeze and Tyler Breeze decides to try and get an easy count out win uh, but Zayn rolls back into the ring on the seven count. Now, because of how Sami Zayn landed sort of around his head and neck area, um, Tyler Breeze decides to focus his attack on the head and the neck. Shots to the head, drop kicks, punches, 
chin locks, everything around the neck area. And what is quite nice is the fact that William Regal, again, refers back to the spill outside as to why Tyler Breeze is kind of focusing in on that area to try and take control of the match. Now, kind of towards the end of this section, the crowd are then kind of picking up with the Ole chance to try and bring Sami Zayn back into the match. And very briefly, he manages to kind of get Tyler Breeze on the outside of the ring and does kind of a springboard moonsault off of the top rope and taking Tyler Breeze down. And they both land quite nastily, to be honest, on the uh, steel rampway. Sami Zayn uses this as his opportunity to get Tyler Breeze back in the ring and try and finish him off. However, Tyler Breeze manages to kind of see this off and focus in again on the kind of head and neck area. This leads to kind of a yay boo punching um, combination, which then leads into um, kind of a chain of reversals and go behinds, ending up with a very, very big super kick from Tyler Breeze to Sami Zayn, again focusing in on the head area. There was a little bit of a botchy bit with a kind of a double underhook um, powerbomb. Um, it does end up finally kind of leading into a powerbomb, but it was a bit kind of clumsy getting into it. They, they kind of tried to reverse out of it and then kind of lost their hold on each other and kind of had to work themselves back into it. But to be honest, this was probably the only real negative part of the match in terms of technical ability. These two putting on a very, very good show against each other. There is a halluva kick attempt, but Tyler Breeze kind of scouts this and just rolls to the outside. So he avoids the contact there. Sami Zayn gets him back into the ring and this does lead to another halluva kick attempt. Tyler Breeze kind of puts his arms up to shield his face, kind of like that. And because of that, his hands kind of come into contact, shall we say, with Sami Zayn's slightly delicate area. Um, there is a bit of confusion with the referee as to whether it was an intentional low blow or not. Tyler Breeze basically trying to say, look, I was just protecting my face, I could see it coming. It, there wasn't anything malicious in it. He then hits the beauty shot spin kick and puts Sami Zayn away for the three count. Tyler Breeze is the new number one contender to the NXT Championship. And this just kind of builds up again more of the Sami Zayn redemption story. He said before the match that he kind of had to learn to lose, especially against Cesaro in their feud, uh, before he was able to learn to win. But this is just another kind of roadblock put in his way basically to, to kind of drag this out before he finally becomes the NXT champion. Just making the crowd want it that little bit more. It was a really, really good showing from both guys, and it's nice to see this uh, event kind of really kickstart with this match after two pretty nothing matches so far. Next up, we have the final of the tournament to crown the new NXT Women's Champion. The previous month, Paige had to vacate the NXT Women's title because she ended up winning the Divas title on her first night on Raw. And JBL basically stripped her of the NXT Women's title because she was not able to defend both belts simultaneously. So they held a tournament to decide the new champion. And the final will be fought between Charlotte and Natalia. Each flanked by a Hall of Famer, obviously Ric Flair coming out with Charlotte and Bret Hart coming out with Natalia. Now the video package of this, it initially focuses in on these two guys but then tries to kind of transition to the fact that these two women are the next generation of these two uh, kind of illustrious families within the world of professional wrestling. I can kind of see what they were trying to do. But I think because they both came down to the ring as well, Brett and Rick, it kind of, certainly at the beginning, it kind of takes the shine away from the the title belt, uh, the tournament, and especially the two women in the ring, which is a shame. The crowd are really just kind of cheering for the fact that Bret Hart and Ric Flair are in an NXT ring. Um, 
which is a bit of a shame. Before the match actually starts, there is a quick kind of promo from Paige where she gets a little bit tongue-tied. Uh, she comes down with the Divas Championship. Uh, God, it's horrible to see that thing. And to be honest, it's really annoying the fact that they keep referring to the women as Divas. Um, obviously, I've kind of blanked that out of my head now. We are four years on from, um, from this time. And I suppose a couple of years removed from the whole revolution that they had where they kind of binned off the Divas Championship and brought back the women's title and quite rightly I think did away with all that kind of verbiage. So it's a bit kind of jarring to hear that still. I think what would have been quite nice is for Paige maybe to sit at ringside or by the commentary desk and actually present the vacant title to the winner, um, kind of almost as a passing of the torch moment, but she doesn't do that. She basically comes out and says, look, the winner of this match here, this is what it can lead to. It can lead to the Divas Championship, which... Funnily enough, it does do for Charlotte, and Charlotte actually ends up being the last ever Divas Champion um, before they reintroduce the women's title. So after Paige's quick, kind of pointless, but meh, promo, she then disappears out back and out come our four people. And the beginning of this match is very much map based between Charlotte and Natalia. It's very much kind of looking at um, putting on various submissions on each other, uh, ground each other, and try and really out-wrestle each other. There's not really much striking going on here. They're not really playing too much to the crowd. They're just focusing in on a really decent sort of mat exchange between the two of them. This kind of plays into Natalia's uh, experience. They do mention that briefly on commentary, although they don't mention the fact that she is a former Divas champion herself. Um, but they do mention that she has been up on the main roster and she has had years of experience within the WWE system. And this kind of leads to her managing to, for the moment anyway, outsmart Charlotte and kind of get more of the upper hand on her. Yes, some of her manoeuvres do get reversed here and there by Charlotte, but Natalia manages again to kind of come out on top and sort of subdue Charlotte for the most part. Until that is, Charlotte ends up kind of hitting a backpack type stunner, almost like a jawbreaker, on Natalia to get herself back into the match. Now, shortly after this, Charlotte hits a moonsault. I'm presuming this is the first time she did, because Byron Saxon actually mentions on commentary that we have never seen Charlotte do this before, which is quite ironic, because she tries to get in one or two every single match she seems to have now, even when she's just having a, a bog-standard match against, say, Mandy Rose or something on SmackDown. Oh, let's just chuck in a moonsault, and usually they're moonsaults to the people on the outside of the ring. But she misses this one... And this is Natalia's way back into the match. There is a little bit of an exchange with a sharpshooter into a figure four leg lock. Um, and they're then kind of within the figure four, both kind of trying to roll the other one over to reverse the pressure, if you can believe that. And this ends up with them rolling basically as, as far away from the ramp as they can and then they roll all the way back to the other side of the ring and then they're in a position where Charlotte is kind of hanging out of the ring Natalia almost sort of holding onto the ropes I think initially to try and break the hold but Charlotte keeps rolling and is actually sort of hanging off the apron with her shoulders sort of on the floor and the referee ends up having to kind of break the hold between them um, probably a good thing just before they pop a knee out or dislocate an ankle or something because at that angle it looks quite gnarly to be honest. When Charlotte does get back into the ring she attempts to put a sharpshooter hold on Natalia and has it held in for a little while but Natalia manages to reverse out of that and attempts to hit Charlotte with a figure four leg lock. This kind of gets kicked off 
and she sets herself up in position for the natural selection. Charlotte hits this and manages to pin Natalia for the vacant NXT Women's Championship. And what's quite nice is seeing her win this with the natural selection. Remember, this was a move she used to hit quite often in NXT and doesn't really tend to bother with it anymore. It's usually the figure four into the figure eight combination. Um, I kind of miss it really. Granted it's not that spectacular of a move but it kind of shows off her um, gymnastic and athletic ability and ultimately the idea behind it is to slam your opponent's face into the mat so it's kind of like a DDT in that respect um, and that's been a finisher for many many years so it would be quite nice to see that come back in some capacity Maybe at a time when um, she's sort of potentially selling a leg injury herself and maybe isn't able to lock it in. Or because everybody has sort of managed to scout that move and is able to put any kind of reverse on it. Maybe she has to revert back to um, the natural selection and win. There are kind of big kisses and hugs in the ring with all four people especially between um, Charlotte and Ric Flair. Ric Flair sort of brought to tears more than anyone in this match, but we can kind of expect that. There is a big kind of hugging moment between Charlotte and Natalia, and Charlotte actually thanks Natalia, presumably for kind of doing the honours and putting over the young up-and-comer in this match. And Natalia kind of lifts Charlotte's hand and declares her the new champion to the crowd before her and Brett exit. Charlotte and Rick kind of soak up the moment a bit more. They exit the ring and Charlotte kind of does one last lap of honour around within the ring on her own with the belt held high. Now this obviously very nicely leads into many, many matchups between her and the others within the Four Horsewomen, ultimately leading to Sasha winning this belt from her in a fatal four-way match between all four of them. And although Becky Lynch never manages to become the NXT Women's Champion, all four of them do at some point manage to represent their respective brands as the women's champion. And what is quite fitting is the last thing you hear at the end of this match is the fact that Charlotte will be making waves in the WWE for years to come. And I think that has very much been proven. Obviously she headlined um, the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view with Sasha Banks the first women to main event a pay-per-view. She was the women's champion at the time of the Royal Rumble, so was unfortunately unable to compete in that. But she was the person to end Asuka's undefeated streak. And she also has most recently featured in the, I guess, third Money in the Bank ladder match for the women, if you count the fact that we had two last year, but was ultimately unable to win that match. But chances are she will go on to be the first woman, or at least if the rumours are to be believed, one of the first women to actually headline WrestleMania in a marquee match against Ronda Rousey. At least that is kind of the plan at the moment if rumours are to be believed. Anyway, moving on from this to the main event, Adrian Neville takes on Tyson Kidd for the NXT Championship. Now we get a little bit of a package beforehand explaining that Neville was obviously able to overcome Bo Dallas in the first ever ladder match on NXT to win the title. He also then transitioned into a feud with Brodus Clay, if you can remember him, um, where Brodus actually knocked out four of Neville's front teeth, but was ultimately able to overcome him. But because of Tyson Kidd's sort of ability and the fact that he trained in the Stu Hart dungeon, he sees Tyson Kidd as kind of his strongest opponent yet. And the most likely, at this stage anyway, to take that NXT title away from him. Tyson Kidd plays up the fact that he used to be on the main roster. He was out for injury for quite a time and I think that's when they transitioned him back into NXT. And basically he is trying to use this as a springboard 
to get back up onto the main roster and feature again on Raw and SmackDown and he sees winning the NXT title as the easiest and quickest way of basically bypassing this system and getting back up onto the main roster. Obviously, um, ultimately that isn't the case, unfortunately for Tyson Kidd. He does um, succumb to a muscle buster from Samoa Joe and because of severe injury from that he is kind of forced to retire sadly um, but it's nice to kind of go back to these uh, older shows and kind of see just what he was capable of doing in the ring these two put on a hell of a match together and the commentary team do play up the fact that these guys are both really, really similar to each other. They both have an excellent ground game. They both are really quick inside the ring. They both are not adverse to high-flying moves. And there are a number of times in this match where they literally do cancel each other out for sort of double-down spots. There is a very early kind of example of this where they kind of flip out of each other's moves and the only difference between them when they're kind of staring each other in the ring is Tyson Kidd gets frustrated and elbows Neville in the side of the face to get the early advantage. Tyson Kidd then kind of dials up the aggression and um, manages to kind of dominate Neville. At one point he gets him up in a tree of woe and viciously starts attacking him in the back, kind of lifting him up and kicking him in the back. Now this is very interesting because this will play into something that happens a little bit later. Ultimately Neville manages to get back into the match. There is a kind of a hope spot earlier where he is um, driven off of the ropes, but he does manage to get the upper hand back over Tyson Kidd and kind of deals him back those kicks to the back in the Tree of Woe position. The kind of latter half of this match is basically spot after spot after spot and decent kind of high spots that lead into each other. First off there is sort of this powerbomb attempt in the corner by Tyson Kidd that Neville manages to actually backflip out of. Um, I don't remember the last time I saw anyone try and do that but it was blooming impressive I must say. Neville then tries to use this to get the upper hand. He goes for a springboard off the middle rope, but Tyson Kidd kind of scouts this and does a kind of leg sweep off the middle rope, slamming Neville into the mat. This leads into one of the weirdest kind of suplex reversal um, spots I think I've ever seen. They manage to get it to a point where they're up close to the ropes, and it looks like Neville is going to suplex Tyson Kidd out of the ring. He does manage to do that, but also spills out the back himself. He kind of almost backflips over the rope himself, and they're both out um, on the side of the ring. But they manage to just beat the 10 count by rolling in on the count of 9. By this point, the crowd is just red hot for this. There is a dueling, let's go Neville, Tyson, kid chant that plays out for the next few minutes as these guys kind of try and get one up on each other to get the advantage in this kind of last phase of the match. Tyson Kidd does try and get a sharpshooter in on Neville. Again, he's Canadian. I guess all Canadians need to do the sharpshooter. This kind of is slightly countered, but Tyson Kidd then manages to hit what uh, William Regal calls a dungeon lock. It kind of almost looks like a triangle choke, but ultimately Neville manages to fight his way out of this. Kid decides to go up to the top rope, um, whether he was going to try and attempt uh, a, a red arrow or not, I'm not sure, but Neville manages to kind of get up, see this, and hit a hurricane runner from the top rope onto Tyson Kidd. And this kind of throws Kid over to the opposite side of the ring. Neville is able to then hit the Red Arrow himself and retain the NXT Championship. Obviously this then sets up a match between himself and Tyler Breeze later down the line for the NXT title. After a bit of kind of soaking up the adulation of the crowd, Neville kind of acknowledges Kid's efforts in this match and tries to kind of offer an olive branch to him. 
he puts his arm out for the handshake, but Tyson Kidd just sort of barges past him and makes his way out to the back, and that kind of garners quite a lot of heat from the crowd. They, after kind of siding with him in parts of the match just purely because of his brilliant work rate um, and ability, they immediately turn on him here when he kind of shows the ultimate disrespect, if you like, to the champion and disregards him and makes his way out to the back. Obviously, I've already mentioned the unfortunate turn of events that um, have kind of befallen Tyson Kidd. Neville, from here, he kind of, well, firstly, he drops the belt to Sami Zayn. He then drops his first name and is just known as Neville, as I'm sure you can tell I'm very much used to that name and not Adrian Neville, as I've been calling him that for the majority of the video. Um, his kind of heel turn when he then goes into the cruiserweight division, wins that a couple of times, but ultimately drops the belt to Enzo Amore. At this point of time of recording, he's still contracted to WWE, but hasn't actually been seen for, I think it's about six months or so, when he decided to no-show Raw because he didn't want to job out to Enzo Amore again, this being just before Enzo Amore was released himself. Whether we see him back in a WWE ring, I am presuming not. Maybe with the launch of the NXT UK brand, maybe he transitions over to that, possibly. Um, or more likely I think he's going to just kind of see out his contract and move to the kind of independent scene and make appearances potentially in Japan or at Ring of Honor or at Impact. But it was a real shame because this was again kind of his highlight. Yes he did manage to become the Cruiserweight Champion um, he had a very good program against Austin Aries, but that ultimately led to Aries leaving the company. And it's just a shame that he was kind of pigeonholed into 205 Live and never really able to do anything up on the main roster. Short from a very, very good match against Seth Rollins a couple of years ago. So there we go. That was the first ever NXT TakeOver. As I said, the first couple of matches were yeah, kind of so-so. It was nice to see the Ascension's dominance after not really seeing it for a number of years. But at that time, it was just kind of a, a showing of them dominating and kind of waiting for decent competition to overthrow them, really. But this show is really all about those last three matches, all of them slightly different from each other but also fairly similar where they were just really focused in on their work rate and kind of trying to put on the best possible showing for the crowd. Obviously with the women's match there kind of wasn't really too much story going into that apart from the history of the hearts and the flares and trying to kind of bring this on to the next generation. The men's matches were very much focused in on Sami Zayn's kind of redemption story and trying to finally win the big one and ultimately coming up short here again. And with the title match itself was very much Tyson Kidd trying to use this as an opportunity to springboard himself back into the main roster and ultimately not being able to do that and for Neville to kind of put another victory behind him before he ultimately loses the belt to Sami Zayn in a few months' time. Overall, this was a pretty good show, um, just kind of hampered by those first couple of matches. Um, if I was to rank it, I would say it was probably a, a solid sort of 7, 7.5 out of 10, mainly, as I said, because of those first two matches. If they had kind of had more to offer this could have pushed it into a kind of 8 9 out of 10 but ultimately still a very very good show and if you haven't seen it please do yourself a favor and at least watch those last three matches so yes that was my review of the first ever NXT takeover 
in a couple of months time I will be reviewing the first ever TakeOver Brooklyn show. Noticeable for the fact that that is when Bailey finally manages to claim the NXT women's title from Sasha Banks. But until then, I have been that British guy and I will see you very soon.